Hello, everyone. How's it going? Yay. Yay. Welcome to CMC. This is part of the Creative Masterclass series. Um, this is a part of a series of talks done by CMC called The Right Stuff, with writers and creators creating content for young adults and children. Today, we're going to be talking to a brilliant writer-creator and a good friend of mine called Holly Phillips. Ho Holly has worked as a writer on many phenomenal shows, including Sugar Rush, uh, Dead Gorgeous, and Million Between. She's, you might also know her as a showrunner, having created shows such as Nearly Famous for E4, The Athena for Sky Kids, and a show we're going to be focusing a, a bit more today, Get Even, for BBC and Netflix. So now it's time for me to introduce Holly Phillips. Welcome, Hartley. They found our cushions. They did. I'm pleased about that. Now, firstly, Holly and I are, are both writers, so we're really not used to leaving the house, <laughs> let alone whatever this is. So laugh at our jokes, and that includes everybody at home, because I'll, I'll know, even if I can't hear you. <laughs> so just help us along as well. And I think uh, there might be a few more people coming in, which is fine, but just try and enter quietly. And I know it's lunchtime as well, so... If you've got crisps and snacks and anything, that's fine, but make sure you save some for us. Um, to begin with, Holly, we've got some clips, I think. We're going to be watching a little, uh, a few scenes from Get Even, so give everybody who might not have seen the show an idea of what Holly's been working on. Good morning, Bannerman. Welcome back. I hope you're excited for the start of a new school term. <laughs> One bullying coach? Exposed. Let's not use the word team. We're not friends. Then what are we? Co-workers in the Department of Vengeance. We didn't have much in common. Just one thing. We wanted justice. I am Kitty Way. You're an excellent student, Kitty. But you're competing against so many other excellent students. I am Bree Derringer. Went to bed a princess and woke up a vampire. What changed? I realized that we're the bad guys. I am Margot Rivers. Does all geekdom come naturally to you? Yeah. I'm Olivia Hayes. She's kind of like your posh, rich, shallow type. This is Batman. We are resilient, <laughs> strong, and proud. Vultures, aren't they? All of them. Just waiting to pick apart the weakest member of the tribe. Batman is the kind of school that will break you down. I think you're having a momentary lapse of sanity. No, I'm having a momentary lapse of honesty. You never called me. Girls always call me. Not this girl. The victim's death is now being treated as suspicious. We are particularly interested in the person or persons going by the name DGM. Ronnie's killer framed DGM. And they're still out there. We are DGM. We don't get mad. We, we get, get even. It's, it's still so exciting to see it. Um, <laughs> how, that's the first thing. How do you feel when watching something you've written on the screen like it's real? Um, oh, it's still a huge mixture of excited, happy, terrified, and insecure. Yeah, all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I've got a few questions for Holly, but um, also you can send some questions into me on the iPad uh, if you at slido.com. Um, if you use the code CMC, as you can see it behind me. Um, so that's get even. That's where you are today. But to start with, I wanted to ask, what, how did you get into writing? Where have you come from that started this big journey? Um, okay, so I, um, I grew up in a little village in the middle of nowhere where there was nothing to do. <laughs> there, the nearest cinema was like 15 miles away um, and there was one bus every two weeks. The nearest theatre was 50 miles in the other direction and I don't even know how you would get to it. Um, so TV was a really big deal to me. Um, and I think added to that was the fact that I was a bit of an, like a lot of writers, an awkward kid and a lonely kid and a strange kid. Um, so TV was very much my friend. 
Um, and I think the shows that I watched as a teenager in particular, like they they meant so much to me. Like I literally felt like those people were my friends in those TV shows. Um, and so that's where the kind of desire to be a TV writer came from. So how, how do you go from being a young person who loves TV like so much of us uh, were and, and for some people are, um, how do you go from there to getting your first big break to being probably part of a writer's room for the first time? Oh, well, mine was definitely, I guess, like a lot of people, kind of around about roots. I had no idea whatsoever how you actually got a job working in TV. I didn't really know you could get a job working in TV. Um, so I ended up doing, I did a screenwriting course in like the nearest city, which was Norwich, like down the road from me in Norfolk. Um, and I remember really well that screenwriting class was like, I was the only girl, it was all guys, and they were all really into Quentin Tarantino, and I was really into Dawson's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like my first kind of training. <laughs> um, but without really, beyond doing things like that, having any idea how you get started, I did a degree that had an element of creative writing in it. Um, my, my tutor was really into poetry, and when I said I wanted to do TV rather than poetry, he was basically like, that's it, we're done. <laughs> I mean, TV was considered like kind of more lowbrow then. <laughs> and so he was just like, no, not really interested in that. <laughs> um, so I kind of wrote stuff quietly on my own, um, got quite bad marks for it, <laughs> because oh. I writing all these scripts about teenagers, um, and they wanted me to write more metaphor. Um, <laughs> but then the piece that I wrote for my like, final kind of degree show, I wrote to play, because I had no idea how you write TV. Um, so I wrote to play, wrote some friends into acting in it, um, got a terrible grade for that. Like, uh, they gave me a third. It was not good. Yeah. Um, but that was the piece of writing that I used to enter a Royal Court Young Writers competition. And the same piece of writing that got a third for my degree won the Royal Court Young Writers Competition. Yeah, it's incredible. And that, that changed my life. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it, it sounds like you were always going to just write. Like after you discovered TV, you, you wrote your way into it. Um, but how did, after working on some incredible shows, how did it come about then that you took the big scary step from working on a TV show to running a TV show? <laughs> um, well, I think I had, I'd had various jobs near it for a while. So by the time I got the chance to run a TV show, I was more than eager. <laughs> um, I'd been in, I'd been in some very good writers rooms. I'd been in some bad ones too. <laughs> Um, I'd been in some where the atmosphere was really horrible, and so I think I had a really strong sense in my head of like, I want a really positive atmosphere in my writer's room. That was something that was always really important to me. Um, and yeah, yeah, I was just, yeah, like I said, I've done a lot. I've written on a lot of shows, a lot of other people's TV shows. I was, yeah. <laughs> this is where I can admit I, I've been in one of Holly's writer's rooms, and I can attest to the fact that it's a lovely working environment. <laughs> Yes. And she's not made me say that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> so by looking at these other showrunners, you're, were you thinking at the time, like when you're in the room, if I, get, if I get the chance to do this myself, that is something I will or won't do? Yes. <laughs> And like, <laughs> like I know that sounds almost kind of like really arrogant, but yeah, I was always, I was always, I love, I love working on other people's TV shows. Actually, I've learned so much from it. Um, you always learn something different from every TV show that you do. I really believe that, um, and flex different creative muscles. But I think always, I was like, one day I want to do my own shows. Yeah. And that's one thing I wanted to ask about in particular. Like when we, when we were working on Get Even, your focus was, and it's something that I've taken away and used myself, you, you really wanted to begin with character. Like, we'd spend days on the characters before even worrying about where we were going to take them across the course of a series. Was that some, one of the things that you've picked up on and would go keep doing? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, partly, there's always this thing of like, are you a character-driven writer or a plot-driven writer, which I hate. <laughs> partly because it's just not true and it's not helpful. Like, character is plot. <laughs> 
Yeah. Like plot is just character in action, so it's an unhelpful thing to have as part of the conversation anyway. Um, but it took me a while to figure that out. I was always like, oh, well, I like character, but I do like it when they do things. <laughs> Again, it just wasn't helped by being told that they were somehow separate things. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I think I do lean towards the kind of like, if you, if, you, if you love people, you return to them. I mean, like I said, my whole starting point was watching TV shows and feeling like these people were my friends. So when I got the chance, obviously that was kind of where I would come from. But I think there was one experience in particular that really confirmed in my head that that's the right way to run a room. And it was actually, I worked on a show in Australia called Dance Academy. Um, and that I was story editor and writer on. And then there was a lead writer whose show it was, Samantha Strauss. And I remember she came to me and she was like, we had like six months, I think, to do, six to eight months to do 26 episodes. So it was a lot and uh, producers were stressed, because of course they were, that's a lot of scripts to do. And I remember Sam coming to me and she said, we need to go to the producer together to say we want to spend the first three weeks in the writer's room just talking about character. And if I say it on my own, she's not gonna be cool with it, she's gonna be too stressed about production and schedule, so let's, can we go say it together? So I was like, yep, yeah, okay, let's do this. Um, and the producer was very stressed. <laughs> very unsure about this as a plan, um, but we fought for it, we got it, it completely paid off. Those three weeks, that was all the hard work. Once we knew those characters inside out, we knew what they were going to do for 26 episodes. We knew them so well, so all of the plotting and storylining after those three weeks was easy, it was quicker, it was more fun, because we knew everybody. I think, I think it might be interesting for young writers to hear what, the, what, we're actually, what we might actually mean when we talk about working on, on, on the characters. Like, so often we run into a problem in a script, with, with writing a script, and the solution is to just go back to the character. Like, there's a reason why something might not feel right, and it's because we need to see what, why this character might not do this thing. But what does it like mean when we say, we're going to spend a day talking about this character. What is it we're actually doing? Because are we just having loose conversations about? I mean, yeah, that's a really good question. I think my approach is definitely at first, it might be quite a loose conversation because you want everyone to kind of bring something to that person. I think, again, as well, especially like teen and YA, like often, and you know this, I'm bringing people into my writer's room because they've got a different teen experience to me. Mm -hmm. So I want those different teen experiences to inform those characters. So actually, I think at first it kind of is just talking about them. Um, and bit by bit throwing in, I mean, my writer's rooms do tend to get quite personal. I, again, I think they have to for the kind of stories we're telling. So there's an awful lot of, talking about things that happened to you when you were a teenager. I, I always overshare because it helps with the work and it, I think it helps yeah. other people once, overshare too. It's like... <laughs> when, once Holly's told a few stories, then you're definitely more open to sharing some of your own. Every, everybody's going to cry at some point and that's okay. It's encouraged. <laughs> Yeah, that's my approach. But then, then it does get more focused, and gradually it becomes a kind of, yeah, what's their inner conflict? How does that inner conflict inform their overall story? Yeah. One thing that you've often done, which I thought we saw has been really helpful, and it's been something I've gone away with, is the certain questions you ask, like, what would this character do with a jar full of sweets? <laughs> is that something you've picked up, and, and like, are there any others that you instinctively go back to again and again? Yes. <laughs> So there are, there are the more kind of obvious ones, and again, I'll do this at, you know, I'll do this towards the end when um, I already know a character fairly well, but what's their strength, what's their flaw, what's their fear, what's their journey, what's their inner conflict, all kind of pretty standard stuff. Um, the ones that I find massively revealing and also fun is, yeah, what would they do with a massive jar of sweets? Um, that one was a recommendation from a writer's room, a different writer's room I did in Australia, and that came from one of the writers, um, because whenever he got sweets, he would order them and he would like have them ordered and he'd have like two sweets and two sweets and two sweets and then once he'd done a certain amount of work he could have one then he could have the other then he'd move on to the next pile of two um so that that again you just kind of look at it and go oh actually everyone the way they would approach that would be slightly different um but he was riffing off one of my personal favorites which i find really useful which is what would this person do at, if there was a dance floor at a wedding 
And would they be the first person on the dance floor throwing some moves? Would they avoid it all night? Would they only do it once a few people had gone up and they felt kind of safe? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think well, it's, it's been brilliant. It's been something that's been really helpful for me. Like character creation is this, it feels like there's so many options and you can only go with your instincts about finding the right ones. But when it comes to something like Get Even, where I don't know how many people might know, it was based uh, on an American series of YA novels by Gretchen McNeil. What is it like then when you have this source material that you're working from? How do you treat the characters then? Oh, it's, that's a really good question. Um, and actually, I think one of the biggest compliments I got after the series came out was Gretchen sent me a signed copy of the novel, and the thing that she wrote in it, this isn't just a brag, I promise. <laughs> it does feel like it could be. She wrote a thing saying, these girls are yours now as much as mine. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing that is not just to go, that was really cool, although it was. Um, it's also because that's actually what you have to do. Like, I had to get to know them for myself. I had to develop them in my own head. I had to develop them with people like you in the writer's room. It's like, actually, even when you're adapting someone's work, you still have to know these people, like, and you have to know them in your own personal way. So sometimes that meant changing things. Um, I, I didn't intentionally change stuff, but it was just about getting to know them and them feeling really real for me and for everyone in the room. And I, moving on to talking about Get Even and the series of books, so much of like what we watch today, people will be aware, is adapted. It's based on source material, and like often it comes from a production company having the rights and then bringing it to a writer like you. Is that what happened with Get Even? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. I'd, um, I'd done a writer's residency with CBBC um, because I think they'd read something of mine. I'd done other, I'd written for a lot of their TV shows, so I had a kind of relationship with them. And at this residency, because it's such a passion thing of mine, I'd essentially spent the whole time going, you should make more stuff for teenagers. Have you thought about making stuff for teenagers? <laughs> There's like this huge gap of people there from like 12 to 18, and you should make things for them. And um, at the time, they weren't really. Um, but they were thinking about it, and it was kind of on their radar. So when optioning Get Even came up, luckily I'd been annoying enough that they thought of me. <laughs> um, I still had to pitch for it. I still remember being terrified. In fact, I remember the train journey going to pitch for it. At the time, I was working on a TV show called Trapped, which is like a Scandi noir. And I bumped into my neighbors on the train, and they were like, oh, it's so cool you're doing that. And I was like, no, but what I really want is this. <laughs> I want to write for teenagers. I know it's cool, it's very cool, I love it, but this is the thing I really want. And yeah, I was, I was pretty terrified. That I still remember so many details about that pitch meeting. It, it does feel like there's a breadth of YA novels that we've grown up loving and, kid, and young people adore still. Why do you think it is then that there is this like, catalog of young people's material that they love to read that's now slowly becoming a more common thing to see on TV? I think it's a bit of TV playing catch up. Um, there was definitely a phase where it was like, oh, young people don't read anymore. And then it was like, well, obviously they do, because look at the sales for The Fault in Our Stars. Yeah. Like, so there was this kind of boom in YA literature, which just showed how massive it was and how much young people respond to it. Mm. And I think the US has always been a little bit better about making content for teenagers, but I think UK TV essentially is just gradually catching up and going, oh, you know what, this is actually a group of people who we could make some TV programs for, it, and, and who love it. I mean, like, they are the best fans. Yeah. Like, it's not, they're not not interested. I don't, if anyone who says that is, they're just completely wrong. I've never, like, you don't, like I said, you know, working on, like, a Scandi Noir, people do tweet about it, I guess it is not the same. They don't make fan vids, they don't make ship stuff. They don't go and write fanfic yet. The way teenagers feel about TV is epic and awesome. And when it comes to adapting a book like Get Even then, it felt like you had a lot of freedom about where you wanted to take it. Like, was that something that surprised you and something you enjoyed? Yeah, no, it, it did a little bit because I think it depends very much on the author, um, how much freedom you get. And Gretchen was very cool. She was always incredibly like, you, you take this on its own journey and you go for it, which was really, really excellent. Um, and one of the things that we did that she was, she was really cool and supportive of, so in the book, 
the four girls are all straight um, is one of the things, and I just felt like that didn't feel totally representative. Uh, like, if we're going to have four girls, like, come on, let's just be realistic. At yeah. least one of them's a bit not straight. <laughs> <laughs> just statistically, come on. Um, so that was one of the changes, and I, and I really wanted to kind of go for it with one of the characters and, and well, yeah, have that storyline part, as part of the mix. Um, and, yes, she was massively supportive, yeah. And what about, then, the production companies you're working with? So Get Even was... Um a collaboration between a company called Boat Rocker, but it was also for two different broadcasters in that it was going to be with CBBC, but also Netflix as well. So when it came to changes like that, that sounds like a lot of people who have to sign off on things. What was that like? Um, it was a lot of people to sign off on things. Sometimes it took a while. Um, it, was, it was good, it was, most, it was surprising, mm. um, partly because Although it was made by CBBC, it was only shown on iPlayer because it was too teen for CBBC. Um, but that was always the intention. They, they actually really had embraced the idea of telling stories for that kind of like, but um, Helen's saying like kind of 13 to 16, it was like, this is this huge gap that we should be speaking to. Um, and so they were very on board with some of those stories. It was actually, although everyone thinks of Netflix as like, the cool ones, um, don't get me wrong, they are very cool. <laughs> um, but we were commissioned by Netflix family. So actually, surprisingly, sometimes they were the ones who were slightly more conservative when it came to storylines. Um, yeah, so that was some of the conversations that had to be had. I, I also think that they're always the conversations you have on writing for this age group, like how do you tell truthful teenage stories, but in a way that's pre-watershed? Like, it's, yeah. It's, it's becoming more common that shows might be on different platforms, but um, for any show that you're making for a platform, the, the broadcaster or the, the um, online demand service, they're going to have an idea of what they want the show to be. So do you feel like it's a, sh it should be a bigger thing writers think about is where they're taking their shows to and that it can really affect and change the show they want to make? Oh, it's a good question. But ultimately, no. <laughs> Okay, now let me be clear about that. I think that what really matters is the people you're telling the story for. Mm -hmm. And whilst you obviously have to find someone to give you the platform and the money to tell the story, I think one thing, and you, and you have to hang on to it, because actually, if you're just trying to please the commissioners, as smart and insightful and brilliant as they might be, and they often are, um, they're still not teenage girls, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, don't get me wrong, there should be more content for teenage boys too. But my core thing is like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about 14-year-old me, I'm thinking about my daughter when she was 14, I'm thinking about every teenager I know. That they're my audience. So I definitely think when coming up with ideas, rather than thinking about the platform, and that will become an issue later on, but rather than thinking about that, I'm, I'm, thinking, about, I'm thinking about that teenager watching it. That's and trying to stay true to that. That seems like a good time to think a little bit more about what we're allowed to say to a teenage audience, given when we're working with a company like Netflix, there's no watershed. Um, we, it's harder to know who might be watching. So keeping things like that in mind, is that something that's becoming more of a, a concern when you're writing, or, or is it something that's called, like, picked up on more? Um, no, it, it definitely is a concern. I think when we were first doing Get Even, Sex Education had just come out and was doing really, really well. Um, and we were literally looking at it because we knew we had to be pre-watershed. It was like part of the, the deal of the commission. So it's like, how do you talk to teenagers and truly reflect their lives when we don't... Essentially, we did not have that toolbox. It was not an option for us to do stuff with sex and drugs and some very real teenage things. It was like, we still want to tell their stories and do something they can relate to. And I think... I think the thing we landed on worked, partly because teenagers did come to it and they did watch it, and older than teenagers watched it too, was we just went, we're just going to have to write up and be smart, and hopefully they won't notice that we're not swearing, and they won't notice that actually we've not talked about the fact they're drinking because it's in a red cup and we're not going to refer to it, and we're just going to make sure that all of the emotional narratives speak to those girls. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And yeah, I've got to say, like mostly, I think there were some questions um, more from the kind of younger end when you like look at the response on Twitter, where you would see people kind of going, "This feels too adult." And then I was like, "Ha!" <laughs> because actually, there's no. <laughs> it's just it's really innocent, actually, in a lot of ways. But it was about being get yeah, emotionally intelligent and not talking down to them. 
That, that's really interesting. Like um, that target that you're trying to hit of engaging with them in a way that we are dis we are trying to not hit them with anything that might shock or offend or hurt them. So how do you feel about that balancing act? Oh, that's really interesting. And how do you um, feel like we, you did on get even with in regards to that? Hopefully, <laughs> did well. <laughs> um, I'd, like to, I'd like to do more. I still think there's a really... It's a really important balancing act to me. There are some more things kind of doing it now. I think to a certain extent, Heartstopper really does this. Um, but I think what we kind of had before was you had teen shows that were so adult skewing that actually, as a teenager, you could feel quite alienated. Um, and, okay, so for example, one thing I really, really want to write one day um, is I'd really like to have a character lose their virginity and it not go well. Mm -hmm. Because essentially, it's a trope in teen things, like girl has sex for the first time, and it's awesome. <laughs> um, thingy did that, normal people, I'm not saying normal people wasn't great, it was great. But for a teenage girl watching that, what does that make her feel like? <laughs> that she's meant to be really good at this thing straight away the first time. That's a horrible, alienating thing, actually, to put into the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. For like, not for an adult audience looking back and being nostalgic, but for a teenager watching, not having a clue what they're doing, <laughs> not having a clue what all of those things mean, that, yeah, that's a bad thing, actually, to say that all this stuff just comes easy and comes naturally. So I think meeting people where they're at is really important and not kind of making them into adults and bringing our adult brains onto it. It feels like to me so many of these conversations in terms about what we're allowed to do, what, what, what's working, what isn't, it, it feels like a lot of them happen when you're first writing the pilot script at that stage in development. And when I became uh, part of the Get Even experience, um, there was already a pilot script that you'd been working on, and I can't remember how many drafts have been done, a lot. <laughs> but that feels like such an important part of the development process, nailing that pilot script. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about what that's like, because so many people, if you're trying to create a TV show of your own, that writing that pilot is so important, it's so scary, it's like, am I supposed to know what happens in the last episode um, when I'm <laughs> writing this? Uh, how do I know what the, what like, should I be thinking about budget, about runtime? What is that like? Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, definitely don't think about budget or runtime especially in the first draft, but ideally not too much, because then it'll never get a chance to come to life. Um, what's hard is that you almost have to switch off the bit of your brain that's thinking about all of those practical things, because to really mm -hmm. be in the world with the characters, you have to be in the world with those characters. Um, so I think those first drafts are so much about just hanging out with those characters. And then they're probably too long and because you've hung out with them too much and you have to edit and you have to punch certain things up. But I definitely think that that's part of the process. Like some of my, and some of those things stay. I think the scene between Kitty and Dante in the pilot episode of Get Even changed a bit, it barely changed. Mm -hmm. But that's because it was two people talking, like so many other things needed changing and rewriting and it went through many, many drafts. But there are moments like that where you've just trusted your instinct and let your brain go and you've just hung out with these characters that actually they're the bits that, they're the bits that are important and they're the bits that don't necessarily change as much. I, I think um, the rewriting process, to use the scary word, <laughs> um, is so important, obviously. It's, it's half of it. It's more than half of it. So how, can I ask how long the rewriting process of that pilot was on Get Even? What would you say was normal? Like? Oh, that's really hard, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what it's like in development, so it's, you know, like you are having, you're doing a draft and then you're getting notes and then doing another draft and then notes and doing another draft. I don't know how many days it would be if I added them all up, probably quite a lot. And do you, do you remember the <laughs> fictitious draft number that was on the front? Because... Oh, I know, it was, I know it was really high by the time we got the green light and we were all in that room. Because I remember one of the other writers, like, literally commenting on it, going, whoa, draft 19, okay then, <laughs> this was a long journey. Uh, something I've been working on, like, uh, there's an X in the title, so when I hit draft 10 and I used the Roman numeral X, I was like, we're not moving past this. So every single new draft <laughs> 
draft. It's not really a new draft. And it went on for far too many drafts before we got to 11. Do you ever do the one that's like, sometimes when it feels like too much, it's just like 1.2, yes. 1.3, <laughs> fourth draft polish? <laughs> well, yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. <laughs> So what, like, is the timescale for the larger development process on something like it even then? What, like, if you were to estimate, when you were brought in, you've got the book, you're going to try to get this thing going. How long was it before Greenlight, and was that normal? What, is there a normal? I, I think Get Even was actually remarkably quick, I think, because everyone really was on board. There was a definite kind of shared vision there, um, which doesn't always happen. But Get Even from... I mean, I think it was like six months in development, roughly, a bit of a gap whilst we were waiting for feedback and notes, then maybe a few more months after the green light of kind of putting all the pieces together and then we were into production. Like it was, it was maybe a year and a half to two years, which I would say for development is, is fast. Yeah. Um, in my experience, norm normally it's longer than that. Um, there are gaps in between and I mean, you guys, know this, as a writer, you're always working on lots of other things. And that's also a big thing I try and do. Um, I hate waiting. So the <laughs> second something's gone into a channel for an opinion, I am working on the next thing because otherwise I will go crazy. And that, at that point, like something that we were talking about before that I thought was quite interesting, were, do you, were you calling yourself a showrunner, a head writer, a lead writer? What, <laughs> how does it like, work? What does that change? Hmm. I, I normally go for head writer or lead writer. Um, maybe just because it feels arrogant to say showrunner, but then I say that, I absolutely care about, so I was also associate producer on Get Even, and I absolutely care about every element that is to do with that. So, so in terms of the work of a showrunner, that's, that's definitely something I'm very much up for, and I love, and I think all writers should, because it's just the extension of... It's the extension of what you've already been doing. It's talking about character. It's just you're talking about character with the actors rather than talking about character with the other writers. Um, and same when it comes to costume or when it comes to set design. All of those things are things that have been in your head for so long. But yeah, I definitely think, for me, showrunner probably is the right term. But I think, like a lot of people, um, imposter syndrome was there for quite a while. And I would feel like that was too big a word. <laughs> But that's, that might be like, quite shocking to like, some of us. Like, you've created multiple shows by that point. You've showrun them. You've worked on so many different shows. And you're even at that stage talking about imposter syndrome. Like, isn't it crazy that that, that can be true? Yes. <laughs> but is that just a part of the experience of a writer? I think like, it is. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think we just, I don't know. You get better at so many things, I think, in the process of being a TV writer. Yeah. Um, things that you maybe think you wouldn't have to be good at. You know, like, I think when I started out, I thought that being a writer would actually mean that I wouldn't have to sell ideas. I was like, isn't that what the producer does? I can just write and they can talk. And then you find out that, no, a huge chunk of your time is going to be in pitch meetings, and you're going to have to be good at that, and it's horrible. But, you know, <laughs> you do it, and you get good at it. Um, and, yeah, but I think there's always this bit of you that just is like, I'm not that important. Mm. <laughs> Can't call me a showrunner, that's like a really big word. I'm not important. But then it's, it's stupid, because it's like, I created it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to get better at that. I created it, I'm a showrunner. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so that, like, we've, you've got a green light, you've got the pilot, and for now everyone's agreed on it. Um, so I wanted to ask about putting together a writer's room, like, what are you looking for? Because, like, as a young writer, that was my first opportunity with being brought in as a shadow writer on Get Even on Series 1. And it was such a brilliant experience because it meant I got to experience being in a writer's room and learning and watching. And it, but it's so hard, like, you've obviously got to look for a mix of experience, but what is it like when it's almost impossible for young writers to get the mythical first credit? Like, how, what is it like when you're putting writers' room together and trying to help young writers and trying to also help your show? For me personally, the two are the same thing. 
because, maybe partly because I'm writing stuff for teenagers, so often newer writers are also younger writers and they're not so far from being teenagers. So there's that that's kind of helpful. Um, and in terms of them just tapping back into their teenage selves, they may be tapping in not so many years ago, so it's <laughs> kind of quick. Um, and I think the other thing for me is, it's the thing I mentioned before, I want a room full of people who their experiences have some connection to the characters in my show. Mm -hmm. um, because there's only so many teen experiences I can speak to. Um, in the end, for an awkward teenager, I managed to cram quite a lot in, but not everything. <laughs> and there are things that I will never know about. So I will never know what it's like to go to a really, really posh school. I will never know what it's like to be one of the few people who's not white in a really posh school. Um, these are things that I'm going to be looking for in my writers. I don't think, for me, it's not a diversity tick box thing. It's a uh, you can't tell a story unless someone is part of that story who's lived that story. Mm -hmm. so, the, so for me, that's way more important than the amount of experience a writer has. They need talent. I'm not just going to, like, again, I'm just going to tick a box. They need to be really talented, but they need to be talented, and they need to have a passion for the genre, and they need to have some connection to the characters. So th th those are things you're looking for when you're reading spec scripts that yeah. you're being sent, but also when you're interviewing writers. Yes. Like, is there like a balance you're doing when you're reading a spec script? Do you think this person's great? I haven't interviewed them yet. Like it's what, how does that work? Is it different case by case? It is different. It, it is mostly on the script, but I would definitely pay attention to things in an interview like the passion, the enthusiasm, and how I think someone might be in the room. Um, yeah, I might be wary of someone who I thought would dominate the whole room mm -hmm. or shut other voices down. I would be like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna help. So that would be something I would. So yeah, I guess if I read an amazing script and then met the person and they seemed like they were going to not allow space for the other writers, I'm yeah, I might not go for them. And um, we talked a bit before about um, what it's like if it's not working out for a writer. Is that something as a showrunner? it might fall in the, your umbrella if you need to either have a word with them about it, like... Yeah, it can do, although I, I... There's a writer I kind of joke with about it a little bit, because there's a writer who I worked with on something, I won't say what, but there was a time, and brilliantly talented writer, she was brilliantly talented, but there was a period where it was like, everyone kind of knew that she was struggling to get there in terms of her script, so actually I just kind of went, okay, me and you were going to work together, just took a larger hand in kind of like beating out the episode together, working on it together, talking through the characters together, and we did all of that, um, and it completely, it turned it around. I mean, they went on to do lots and lots and lots. Um, so it was an amazing thing to go on, but the thing that I always joked with, when I called them to say, everyone loves your latest draft, when I called to do the reassuring phone call, she said to me, she was like, when I saw your number, I was terrified that this was bad news, because I saw it was you, and I was like, oh no, if it was really bad, bad news. <laughs> that would be on an exec. <laughs> when they make me exec producer rather than associate producer, I will do the horrible <laughs> phone call. But until then, I'm going to stick with the nice ones. <laughs> but you, you're hitting on something like, I think that's really important, really interesting, is like, it's scary as a young writer and as a writer, like, failure is a part of the creative experience. And when you're in a writer's room and in the writing process, like, on something like Get Even, we, we went from the room to having to pay, make polished drafts. Like the, the gap between finishing the writer's room to finishing the, like the production draft was not much more than a month. Yeah. So there really wasn't the time to get stuff too wrong. Like I remember being so scared handing in my first draft. Like, because there isn't time to have missed the mark by that much. And all the work you've been doing, it was, it's like a supportive experience. Like, um, it's not like you're just sent away and you've got meant to come back with a script. You go from, uh, you, you know what episode you're doing, you have to do a one-page uh, dot, well, this is how uh, you should be telling this, not me. <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> Carry on. So we went from a one-page, which was just in prose, tell the story, simple as possible, and then we went into like a scene by scene. So it was, again, paragraphs for each scene. We, I think we'd moved on to a screenwriting software by that point. But so it felt like we were taking a gentle baby step towards it being a script. <laughs> and then once you'd gone through multiple stages of notes on that, only then would you go to do the script. So you had this document that was telling you, 
Okay, what's the next scene? I know what the next scene is. Everyone's agreed with me what the next <laughs> scene is. So it's not like you disappear and have to produce something out of thin air. But at the same time, that doesn't fully get rid of the chance that you might not have nailed it. No, handing a first draft in is always terrifying. I'm still terrified handing in a first draft every single time. I don't know if that helps at all, but <laughs> it is a terrifying thing, handing in the first draft. Um, I think the other thing is, is that if someone's taken you on board as a new writer, they really want it to work out. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they're not, they're not, no one's reading your work kind of looking for what's wrong with it. They're actually reading your work, looking for what's right with it. They want it to work. They want it to be, I mean, in some ways, purely budgetary. It's better if it works out. Um, but no, it's, it's an emotional thing too as well. It's like you put your team together, you want it to work. So I think, I think everyone is invested in, in like, everything coming together. Like, um, as I say, I was a shadow writer on series one, which meant um, I wrote uh, a... And a, a version of the second episode that everybody knew wasn't going to be filmed. Uh, Holly was also writing Ep 2, and hers was much, much, much better. And, uh, but I got to go through the experience of meeting the deadlines, of um, writing a script, of exploring the characters. I'd been in the writer's room, so it was, it, it was such a good opportunity for me to learn. Do you think there's enough opportunities like that for young writers? I mean, do you think we need them? We need more. We definitely need more opportunities like that. Because I think you're absolutely right. Learning on the show is such a good and important thing to do. Um, people are scared of taking on new writers, so it's a great way to kind of make them less scared. Um, there, are, there are more schemes that are happening, but yeah, there's definitely not enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's definitely a, it's a constant thing, the kind of trying to find those opportunities. And for me, as a writer, I'm trying to make those opportunities happen. I mean, we had the conversation about it when, when you were brought on board. Um, and, I, and I remember that kind of thing of like, OK, can we do a shadow scheme? Where would we find funding for a shadow scheme? And yeah, people went out of their way to find the funding for the shadow scheme mm -hmm. too, because that's the other one for everyone to just be, try not to work for free. Because I know we all work for free all the time, because we're writers, obviously. But if, if, as an industry, we mean it about being more diverse, that means class diversity too. And that means that not everyone who becomes a writer should have some kind of like Virginia Woolf separate income. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that one always stayed with me. It was Virginia Woolf's like, to be a writer, you need a private income and a room of one's own. And I had neither because I got pregnant very young and had no money. So I was like, I'm better than you, Virginia Woolf. I don't need either of these things. <laughs> I will be broke with a kid climbing on me and I will deliver. <laughs> But basically, it, should not be an in, it shouldn't be an industry where, you know, you have to be rich to do it. Mm. And that's why it matters that these things are paid. I'll get off my soapbox now. I think you're right. <laughs> I think it's really fun. <laughs> so we've gone through Greenlight. We've got our, our brilliant scripts. I wanted to ask next about your role uh, in the next few stages. Like, importantly, what was your role in something like casting? Like, You've got these characters in your head. You've spent weeks, months, possibly years with them. What was your role in, in trying to find the people who are going to become them? Um, so, again, we, we all got to say. So I got to say, as, as lead writer and associate producer, the execs got to say, the commissioners got to say, everyone got to say. Um, and it, was, it, it did kind of work out. Like, ultimately, I think we all kind of got there. Um, but it was really funny to have sometimes your expectations that it's going to be harder than it is. And there was a moment with one of the characters where I knew that Netflix really liked one particular person for one particular role who I felt in my heart was not right for the role. I just, I just did. It was just like, they could act, but not for this particular role. It's like, they're really, really good. And I was so convinced that they were going to shut me down. I was like, this is going to be awful. They're going to cast the person who I don't think is right. It's going to be so stressful. It's like, and they literally came back and went, of course we wouldn't force someone on Holly who she doesn't think is right. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, of course they wouldn't. That would be a crazy thing to do. <laughs> But I think sometimes you hear so many horror stories about how these processes work and like how powerful people will, you know, yeah, tell you what to do. So yeah, actually the casting was it. It was rocky at times, but definitely I think we ended up with people that we all loved. Yeah. And when you're working with these actors, like, is it part of your job to help them discover who this person is? I think I've always just made it part of my job. 
<laughs> I mean, obviously, it's a part of the director's job too. But again, in TV, directors are coming in and then they're leaving. So yeah, for a long time now, I've, I've kind of made a point of I'm there for the first rehearsals so I can chat to the actors about their characters. And actors love chatting to writers because essentially we're obsessed with the same thing. We're obsessed with what makes a person tick. So mm -hmm. actors always want to talk to writers and writers always want to talk to actors like it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, I've, I, like I said, I've, I've kind of made it part of my job and now people just deal with the fact I'm going to do it <laughs> and I'm going to be there and I'm going to talk to the actors lots. Um, and I get them to fire questions to me as well. That's something I've started oh, doing. Just give them my email and get them to ask me questions. I don't care because it only makes the performance better. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and it's continuity. Like I said, often a director's coming in and going, um, you're going to be there for the whole thing. And does that include being on set? Like, what's your role when production is happening? <laughs> um, I, I kind of think the role of a lead writer on set is pretty excellent because I don't have to get there as early as everyone else. <laughs> I mean, I could, but I don't have to, so I don't. <laughs> um, but when you arrive, everyone's really pleased to see you and they get you coffee. So it's kind of great. <laughs> um, I, mostly, I mostly do see my role as kind of like being there for the cast and any questions the actors might have. I visually, obviously so much of the visual style does come from the script, but I, I will try and shut up and let the director frame the shot without saying anything. And mostly I succeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also chatting to costume and stuff too and hair and makeup, that's the other really useful thing you can do on set. And again, that's all character related. Um, and so in my experience, costume want to talk to the writer because they want to find out more about the character. They want to sit and have those chats about what kind of t-shirt they might wear. Like, they're, yeah. <laughs> I think it can only help if you're there as someone for them to even just bounce any questions mm -hmm. off, like in that regard. Um, so uh, post series one, series one released, big success, lots of uh, celebration and adoring fans. So you're making series two and then a little pandemic uh, happened and the world kind of changed for everybody. What was, what I, I was like, uh, in the process, so I was there to see it. But can you talk about, because even if it's not going to be a pandemic, things happen with TV shows. Mm -hmm. Like, it, the plan doesn't always happen. Can you talk about like what happened there and what it's like for you as a showrunner? Yes. <laughs> um, so we were well on our way um, when the pandemic hit, of making season two of Get Even. Um, we, were, we had scripts for the first four episodes, we had storylines for the next four episodes, storylines that had been worked on and reworked on many, many times. I think at the point where we sh found out it was all falling apart, I had 82 different documents in my Get Even 2 folder, from story outlines to scripts to ideas to character notes. Like, it was, it was pretty massive. But anyway, everyone knows what happened. Pandemic happened. We had to shut down filming. Um, because we film in school, we couldn't just shut down for a few months and then pick back up again, because actually the school was then going to be full of school kids. So our only filming window was the summer. So when we shut down, the only possibility for picking things back up again was the following year. At that point, I think we were still like, it's okay, we'll just pick things up the following year. Um, but two things kind of happened. Um, the actors' contracts, they were all contracted to finish at the end of that summer. Their contracts came up. And Get Even came out on Netflix. And then it got even more attention, especially in the US. And our cast got loads of attention and got loads of amazing job offers. And Fair enough, they couldn't sit around with their lives on hold because amazing, exciting things were happening for them. So they didn't sit around with their lives on hold and there was that horrible moment when it was like, uh, yeah, so those four girls, <laughs> your whole show's based on, they're all gone. <laughs> um, so at that, point, I, at that point, I thought it, there probably wouldn't be a series two. Um, but when essentially it was like the conversation happened of like, well, what would you do? what would you do if you were going to kind of do some kind of a series two? And actually, then it started to come together quite quickly um, because there were so many things we hadn't been able to do with series one for a number of different reasons. Um, so we just, yeah, we just had a lot of different ideas. So started thinking about new characters, new stories. Um, one just really quick, easy example of it. 
because we were kind of running from the books with season one, the kind of the gay love story that we had in season one was quite a messy, toxic, complicated one because it was between two female friends and it was quite a messy friendship, so therefore it was quite a messy love story. And we'd had so many conversations in the writer's room about actually wanting to have a really positive lesbian love story. And that wasn't those girls. So we could never really have done that with those two girls. It just wasn't their dynamic. But then we were like, oh, if we're having all new characters... <laughs> then let's do that. Let's have our lovely, beautiful, positive lesbian rom-com. And so that was one of the, that's just one example of one of the things that we got to do because everything changed. Um, and actually, I think um, Rumi, who plays one of those characters, um, is one of my favorite characters. So yeah, a character that I wouldn't have got to invent came to life because of that. One thing that I've definitely got from watching you work is every problem, whether it is a small, tiny note or we're going to have to begin from page one, it very quickly becomes an opportunity in your head. And I think when you're working with like someone who's so excited about that process and excited to reinvent and rediscover, it makes the harder, messier, impossible obstacles that writing and making TV throws at you a lot more enjoyable, I think. Yeah. I think it does it does help to be, I'm like, I am a very positive person, and I think that really helps in this job, because it is a job that can throw you a lot of reasons to get a bit cynical. <laughs> but, yeah. So, what about going forward? Like, what are you thinking about and doing now when it comes to, like, wanting to see more content being made for this audience? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, as you will probably all have guessed, I am, I'm completely obsessed with it. I think that there's not enough stories for people of this age. I think it's an age where, where you really need stories because everything in your life changes. Like the difference between who you are as a 12-year-old and who you are as an 18-year-old is massive. Like they're the years you literally become who you're going to be. And you should get more stories to watch whilst you're going through all of that. Um, so yeah, all that kind of desire and that kind of frustration as well um, led me to set up my own production company called Adolescent Productions, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, roped in a couple of people who I've worked with before to kind of come on board and help as, as execs and development producers, um, with the whole mission of the production company being to find, yeah, to tell adolescent stories and to also hopefully tell some British adolescent stories as well so they're not all American skewing. Um, and, and we got funding from the Young Audience Content Fund and we couldn't have developed our first show mm -hmm. as we have been developing it without them. So I want to do a shout out to the Young Audience Content Fund too. Couldn't have done it without them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, that's so exciting. Like, what, what is that like as a writer who's like worked with production companies to like be beginning one? Um, there's more admin than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> and it? it is funny, the things that you're comfortable with and the things that you're less comfortable with. So um, me and the people I'm working with found out very quickly that the process of finding writers for our first writer's room just a joy. We were just like so excited. We're like, there's this new writer and this new writer and this person and this person. The only hard thing was narrowing the list down because we had too many. That was really fun. Um, figuring out who to hire to do our business affairs, that was like, oh, this is new. <laughs> but you know, learning. <laughs> there's a lot of emails. There's a lot of emails. <laughs> but in all of the shows you've worked on, we've talked a little bit about um, our mental health as writers and how we look after ourselves. Like, I think that's something we don't talk about enough and we can talk about even more. Like, what would be your, like, tips for writers, like, who are up against a blank page and, or deadlines or the <laughs> myriad problems that we're constantly trying to get, yeah. fight? <laughs> A few, a few th okay, I'll just, I'll just go with the, the things that help me. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of them, I feel like it's something that we just all do all the time, but it's a good thing to do. I definitely treat every new idea, that's, how do I put this? As a teenager, I was kind of enthusiastic in my dating life. Yeah, I'm going to go with that, enthusiastic. And I would really enthusiastically throw myself into every new boy I met. And sometimes they turned out to be the worst. Um, but that was okay. 
And I think that I view developing new ideas in the same way. <laughs> I throw myself into them. I'm really passionate about them. When I'm working on them, that is my whole life. When I'm in the zone, I'm there. I'm passionate. I love it. It's everything to me. If it doesn't happen, if it doesn't work out, that's OK. There's, there is always a new idea to work on. I just saw the red light. Yeah, it dawned on me that we're working with a coloured like thing, and I'm colourblind, so I really forgot that. <laughs> I keep looking over and going. I'm just it, going. It's it, doing something. It's definitely a colour, <laughs> but which colour is it? Like, so yeah. Um, so I think um, now we can. Do we have, do we have time to go to questions? Like a couple questions <laughs> from anyone in the audience. You might want to ask Holly something. We also have a uh, Slido to go to as well. Uh, I think we have a question over here. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you for that. This is high quality microphone. Um, <laughs> so, you know, thank you for that um, sort of interview as well. So I'm uh, a writer, so I make comics. Um, and I've got like a bunch of questions, but I'm going to try and be selective because uh, as well as making comics, I also work with young people um, in sort of comic storytelling sessions. So I'm going to ask a question on sort of their behalf. But you talked about sort of writing content for young audiences. So this is more about sort of young audiences making sort of content. So the young people I work with are not necessarily at the stage of like, I'm ready to write, where do I go? It's more about sparking an interest in that and then developing early skills. So as you talked about the writer's room, is there anything for like young audience, I'm talking like teen, maybe like preteen, that they can focus on either to spark that interest in, in writing or develop a particular skill. So if there's a particular area, I know you talked about character a lot earlier, but if there's any particular area that they can focus on that I can keep in mind when I sort of go and work with them, that would be like a big help. Oh, I, the simple answer is to encourage them to watch stuff. Um, because the more you watch and you're inspired, I feel like that really helps your own creative process quite a lot. Um, I know that's a really basic one, but I definitely think kind of like just watching like, what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite film? You know you could do that. <laughs> that's something that you could do with your life, I think is really, yeah, it's really key. Um, and then I guess monologues are good in terms of a kind of step into the process, um, because that's just the voice that's the first way to access like one voice in your head before you start adding in loads of characters in your head. Um, and so I definitely find that, yeah, I've done a little bit of kind of doing workshops with, with kind of, yeah, younger end of teens, and, and that's often quite a good way in, because then it's essentially just going, write your story. Um, and that's where you begin, and then, then you build out, and then you kind of like start fictionalizing it. But sure. we can all start, I think, with just sitting down and writing our own stories. OK, cool, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a question from Slido now. Uh, this one's from Lucy. Um, how many writers were in the writer's room, and at what point do you start building it? For example, is it after you, as a showrunner, have done a pass on the pilot script? At what stage does that start coming together? So with Get Even, and traditionally, um, it's after you've done the pilot script, and it's when you've got the green light. That's normally when, essentially, you have the budget for it, because then the show's actually happening, and then you can start hiring people to come and join your team and write the show with you. Um, I definitely think sometimes when you can, having a writer's room in the development process is really good, and um, like I just mentioned, um, doing the project of my own production company, that was part of it. We, we did a, a small writer's room as part of the development process. Um, and that's a slightly different thing, but I think if you, you can get the funding for it, you should, because again, you get different voices in that room. Um, you get different perspectives and you get different life stories. So yeah, when I can, I love to do it in development too, but normally it's, it's afterwards. Uh, one, one more question we've had that is I think quite interesting is, um, were there any ideas you had for the show that you had to drop to fit the tone? Not really. No, but I do have lots of ideas of stories I'd like to tell, you know, like I was mentioning before, like I'd like to do a, an honest, <laughs> messy virginity storyline, which mm -hmm. would be, you know, I couldn't have done that with Get Even. Um, yeah, so that there's maybe some that I would like to do for the future. But overall, I think you can normally, and overall, I think you can normally do it. I think, yeah. And um, uh, how do you keep out of your adult brain um, and ensure ideas speak to teenagers today? I think that's a great question. It is a good question. Um, this might be very me-specific. Um, I, I don't really 
I've never really grown up. Um, it might be partly because of like choosing to do a thing that was so embedded in teenage me, but I can access teenage me incredibly easily. I can probably access how I felt as a 15-year-old much better than I can access any kind of adulting. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, uh, having uh, to uh, find the bank to talk about the mortgage, no, doesn't come naturally. Remembering the first time I got rejected by a guy, oh, it's right there. <laughs> it's so close to the surface. Um, so yeah, that's that, essentially, I just... And it's crazy, because being a teenager, it kind of sucks. But hey, I may as well use the ability to access that for some good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really good point for us to end on. Um, I want to say thank you, Holly, and to, to Rachel and Oliver as well for setting this up, and to... Darren and the whole tech team and our brilliant runners who have been uh, helping with mics and stuff. And thank you to everybody here and at home as well. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>